Good morning, everyone. So, I hope everyone's having a great weekend. Yesterday was about perfect weather for me. I don't know about the rest of you, but a little bit overcast and warm, I'll take it every day. So, um, just for uh, announcements, there's just a few here that I want to make sure we highlight. Bible studies. Um, the ladies are still doing their 10 o'clock on Tuesdays. And Jen will be there this week, she says. You heard it here first. Uh, Wednesday night, the ladies evening Bible study at 6.30. Is that still happening? Okay. Men's Bible study. We are going to do it Wednesday at 7. We will be here at the church. Ralph Stickerson is going to teach our course. And uh, we are tackling the subject of grace. So, if you guys are interested in that, come on out. Well, we figured that out. I'm great Grace. Oh, okay. So, taco, uh, the taco bar. That was great. Thanks, everyone, that, that came and, and enjoyed that. And, and they went to our youth. I don't know what the exact number was, but I know it was over $300. So, thank you guys all for that. Um, now... Falling right up on the heels of that, next Sunday, we are going to have a breakfast, a Mother's Day breakfast. Everyone is invited to come eat breakfast, but we're going to be celebrating the mothers. So that is at 9.30 next Sunday morning. So instead of Sunday school, we're going to have a breakfast. So try to make it to that, guys, and uh, bring your mother with you. Um, they are gone right on the, the youth retreat. is gone this weekend uh, in Cincinnati, so... Uh, youth camp. There are still forms out there on the desk. Make sure you pick those up if you're interested for those because they do need, I'm not sure what the date is, but Karen needs the deposit relatively soon. Anybody in the Okay. All right. Um, I think fuel's coming up as well. So for you teenagers, get to look on the, I know registration's open for it, but I don't know what the registration dates are. So look into that. Uh, prayer request, as we move forward here, please take a look at the prayer request each week, and if there's anything that's related to you that has an update, or needs to be taken off, please see Jen with that. We'll take care of that. <coughs> so with that, we'll open prayer. Oh, Larry has something. Yeah, I want to uh, thank you. If you look around the church, there's some projects going on. Uh, we have a new entryway. We have an extra room being built downstairs for storage. And sometime this summer, we're going to get our driveway repaved from the edge of the church down to this end. Now, how we have done that is the board decided, I, mean, I don't know how long it's been now, two years, to set aside 5% of our ties into a permanent improvement fund. And by doing that, we have been able to gain money and traction. So we're not blowing all your money. Well, we are. <laughs> so that's, that's the projects that are paid for. And uh, Chuck is doing our room downstairs and doing an excellent job. He'll be done. I don't know what he's done. No, it's not done. But he'll be done with it soon. He'll be painted. And that's going to take, alleviate all of our stuff sitting out of our room. It'll all be going in that room. So those are the projects we're undertaking and it's been done with your ties to improve our grounds and the appearance of our church. Thank you. So thank you guys for your giving. Um, you know, otherwise we'd have to come to you guys and ask for money to do each of these things. So instead, being good stewards, and I attribute a lot of this to Beth, we've been putting some away for the rainy day type situations. So, all right, let's open the prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the people here. Thank you for the church here on earth. Um, be with us as we go through our days that we might better reflect your love for this world and the people can look at us as a shining light in your name. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's very empty up here today. <laughs> so you guys just sing extra loud. Give all of your energy and give all your praise to the Lord this morning. Would you stand and sing with me? We're going to start with Open Up the Heavens. <laughs>
this song came out just for worship. <clears throat>
I think it's money. But anyway, uh, <coughs> she's going tomorrow, and he's supposed to open each wound. She has three of them on her knee. He's doing this all in the office. He didn't want to do her as an inpatient or an outpatient that way. And he's going to embed antibiotic beads down into each one. But she will be awake and just having locals for those, so she could be in a lot of pain. So if everybody remember her there. And then our daughter appraised, she did she had her MRI and there's no there's an infection in the very front of her foot, but there's it didn't hit the bone. They were worried about it hitting the bone and she's fine. Well thank you for that. Maybe you don't know, or if you do know, Cheyenne Lowe had her, <clears throat> lost her baby in delivery yesterday. And uh, the uh, John and Jen went to her and had a dedication service for her child. Her infant child. And uh, we thank John and Jen for that. And just pray for Cheyenne and the family. It's a, it's a situation that's not very good all around. So remember that family in your prayers, Cheyenne Low. And uh, this is kind of silly, but it's not for our family. Um, we have given away 15 puppies in the last year. That is a story in itself, okay? But we, um, they were all late because the, the last one that we kept for ourselves went <coughs> away last night. And we've given all these puppies away. And, we had another one that did that, and we found it. So I'm just glad. Yeah. <laughs> it just makes me happy. So. Thank you for that. I had some test results, or some tests done, some blood work done this week um, for just some depression and anxiety issues and panic attacks that I've been having and uh, some other things. So they're checking my thyroid levels, and I'm just hoping it's not, sounds weird to say that I'm hoping there's something wrong with my thyroid, but I'm hoping there's something wrong with my thyroid because that means they found it and they can fix it. So, um, so just, I should get those results tomorrow. So please just pray <coughs> that I get some answers. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, it's the unknown is yeah. sometimes the words you want an answer. Yeah, Kenny. Yeah, there's a friend of mine, uh, his grandson, Reese Cochran, has not <laughs> stage B leukemia, I believe. 18 years old, he was a KR. And he was at the Tilt Hospital the other day. And he's a senior Kenton Ridge. Senior KR, I believe. Okay. Brothers? Unspoken, show of hands. Thank you for those. Father, we thank you for this day and for these prayer requests. For those in pain, each are suffering. Let the doctors find a comfort zone for them, for those tests that are being conducted, for those who have lost loved ones, for all these things you have put before you today, Father. We know that you hear them, and your love that we ask through your name, through your son's name, and we, we come to you and present the unspoken, you know, those before we even ask. Thank you, Father, be with uh, John as our message presented today, our worship team. Continue to bless this church in his name. Amen. And now we'll continue with God's tithes and our own. Father, now thank you as we come to you presenting your tithes and our offerings. We ask you to use these for the good of your church, for the outreach, for spirituality, and for the physical things that need to be done in your church. Bless the gift and the giver, in Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, this is the time we set aside for our communion. And uh, they've asked me to uh, share a couple of comments or thoughts with you guys today. And so, I always find it interesting um, when I start thinking about communion comments. Because I have all these lofty ideas of where I'm going to get my idea from and what it's going to be about. And, and then I get some notes and I start writing them out. And I'm thinking, man, you know, wow. Is, is this inspired or what, you know? <laughs> and then I sat down beside the bonfire last night, and all that goes out the window. And I start over. And um, so, for those of you that don't know, we have a little fire pit out at the end of our property. And it's just a small little thing, just something to set aside. And uh, guilty, I was taking a nap yesterday afternoon. And my wife gets up and walks out of the room, and I'm like, she go? And she has a fire going down the fire pit in the middle of the day. I'm like, what's she doing there? Well, we had some, a little brush pile. By the end of the night, she had consumed the whole brush pile. It was gone. <coughs> and, and so, sitting there looking at the fire, you know, I start thinking about, you know, what, you have to continually feed a fire over and over and over. You can't just light it and walk away. It has to be fed because it consumes things. And so Webster defines consume as to do away with completely. So in other words, when you're done burning that brush pile, there's nothing left. There's some ash, but for the most part, you've lost everything. And so as I start to think about that, and I look into the Bible, um, Deuteronomy, and then again in Hebrews, it, it talks about in Deuteronomy, Moses is, is issuing a warning to the people. And um, it's about idolatry and about not, not chasing after a false god or anything along those lines. But in Deuteronomy 4.24, it says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. <coughs> consuming. Wow, that that's completely destroys is that what we're talking about? Is that, is that where we're at? And so you follow over to Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Um, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful, and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And it actually references back to the Deuteronomy. So when I think of consuming, do I think of love and grace I don't but you have to understand what these passages are talking about they're not talking about consuming you and I they're not talking about consuming the things in our life that we love and we hold dearly the people, the things, the, you know, anything like that this is talking about God is consuming the things that distract you from him in order to bring you closer to him and so when they talk about the idols the consuming fire you know, think about Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, fire consumed them because they were a distraction from what God was trying to bring forth. So, when you think of consuming, you think of it to be somewhat scary, awe-inspiring. But when you realize that God's doing it because He wants to be closer to you, and He wants to take away all those distractions and all those things that pull you away, that's a kind of love that you can't even fathom. And so, what do we need to do when God takes these things and, and, and removes them from our lives? And I find myself, and I struggle with this, but I find myself that you want to have those moments of stillness in your life. You want to have that time that you set aside and, and you're just, that's God's time. Whether you do it on your drive to work, just turn off the radio, turn off the phone call that you're talking to somebody. You know, or if it's in the morning, you get up before everybody else does and you spend a half hour just looking at your Bible, thinking about God, thinking about your life and how He plays a part in your life every day. And so along with that, Exodus 14, 14 came to mind. And in Exodus 14, 14, the verse itself says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So in that, I think that that's that's the challenge to us is 
I can't speak for your life, but I know my life. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people's lives in this in this congregation. You're busy. Every hour of your day has a plan to it. There's something that has to be done, something I should be doing. Why didn't I get that finished? But I think foremost and to the forefront, we have to put our time with God. We just need to take a moment and be still and, and listen. Because I I tell my kids this all the time, and it's advice I should probably take for myself. When you ask a question, listen for the answer. We don't always do that. We throw up a prayer and we move on to what's next. We don't take the time to listen and see how things are happening in our lives. So my challenge to you today, not only with this communion service, but moving forward through this week, is to take some time, to spend some still time, to be with God, to listen for God and what He's saying in your life. So with that, I'll ask the blessing and one prayer. Father, thank you for everything that you give us. Thank you for the opportunities that we have in our lives. And thank you for the things that do keep us busy. But never let that be a situation that draws us away from you. Because we know as time goes, and as you've shown before, that the things that draw us away from you will eventually be consumed. And there'll be no more. So help us to find our way to you and to spend our time with you and find your desire in our lives to be fulfilled. So with this, we take the bread. And thank you for the sacrifice that your son gave to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
um, but you choose to love us. Um, and there's never enough we can do to thank you for that, Lord. Please focus our minds and our hearts on you. Let us be still and love you more each and every day. Please bless this cup to our body. In your son's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. 
for kids, this is the first time they've ever been to the big city, where they've actually ever seen, like, wow, you know, there's so much more out there. And one of the, the uh, neat places you can visit, of course, is the Washington Memorial. Many of you have been there and have seen it. A very tall obelisk, you know, that was a memorial to George Washington. And, well, one time we got up there, and uh, there were a lot of people scattered out all over the mall and all over that area. This was before they had built the, the World War II memorial and all that, so there was a lot of land out there. So we get in line to, to get into the Washington Memorial. Now, they got an elevator that takes you all the way up there, so you don't have to climb up the stairs or anything. So we get in line, and the lady in the line says, it's a one-hour wait for the elevator. And the kids are like, oh, an hour. And she goes, but there's no waiting for anyone who wants to take the stairs. And everybody was like, ah, oh, uh, we'll wait an hour. You know, well, come on, let's, let's take the stairs. You know, no, no. So one kid, he said, I'll take the stairs. So he runs up there. Within five, ten minutes, he's up at the top. He's waving down at it. And I'm like, you know, that kid, he, he knows what it's all about. He took it, saw it, took advantage of it, took off. It just reminds me of how, you know, we hate to be bothered to do things. We hate to, you know, we're so used to being in our, our daily grind, the rat race, that whenever something unexpected happens, it just throws us all off and we become discombobulated and I mean, I know when I'm sitting in my easy chair, if I can't find my remote, I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to have to get up and walk over to the TV and change the channel. And I'm just, it makes me mad. I don't want to do that. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I can remember being a kid and we didn't have such things as remotes or, you know, I was the remote. My dad said, hey, get up and go turn the TV to channel 10. I'm like, okay, dad. Yeah. I was the remote. So... But we don't like to be bothered. Sometimes we'll, we'll shoot a text off to somebody, and if they don't respond within a minute or two, you're like, what's the matter? Why aren't they responding back to me? I didn't get a text back. Well, what are they doing? Maybe they're thinking something. Maybe they're, no, maybe they just never answered their phone yet. But we get so worried about it. We live in a world where we want results right now. We want stuff now. With as little effort, preferably, as possible. I mean, my track kids, we're down to, I mean, we've had so many injuries and, and things this year. It's been insane. But these kids, they want the medals, but they haven't learned yet. you got to put in the work to, before you can get the medal. you you got to, you know, you have to work at this stuff. And so many times, you know, I see that in kids today. They want the A without having to work for it. They want the, the medals without having to go through all the hassle to get there. <clears throat> and it's just human nature. We, we don't like to be bothered with things like that sometimes. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 3. And I want to look at an example where Jesus was kind of caught off guard and he was forced into engaging in ministry at a time that was not really convenient for him. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. So we're, it's, uh, it's the Sabbath day. And if you remember, on the Sabbath day, Jews are supposed to, to rest. And, it, it, you know, you weren't supposed to really engage in any kind of work or labor. And, and you know, and we'll talk about that, why God had imposed this idea of a Sabbath. But anyways, uh, so they go to the synagogue, verse, three, or verse 1, and he entered again into a synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. He probably had some kind of defect, or maybe a palsy, well, I'm not sure, but something was, was wrong with his hand. And they, who were talking about the Pharisees, they were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. He said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. He said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved in their hardness of heart, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out immediately 
began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. So here you have the Pharisees who have been trying to catch Jesus breaking a Jewish law so that they could bring him before the Sanhedrin, that's their religious council, basically looking for an excuse to give them legal cause to prosecute Jesus. They want to get him out of there. They're, they're, Jesus is causing all kinds of trouble if you're a Pharisee. So Jesus enters the synagogue. He finds the man with the withered hand. Now, it would have been more convenient for Jesus to, you know, maybe heal the guy on any other day of the week. Jesus knew that if I take action here, if I heal this guy, they're going to get on me again. There's going to be a showdown. I know what they're waiting on. You know, but the need was evident. And Jesus, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, decided to show mercy and go out of his way to heal the man. And it would have been easy for Jesus to say, hey, hey buddy, come up here. Why don't you, you come back tomorrow about the same time and I'll heal you. Just have faith and believe. I mean, that would have been a miracle. I mean, we would have all been happy to have seen that. Wow. You know, Jesus made a promise. He could, but no, Jesus saw the need, and despite the circumstances, despite the fact that it was not convenient for him, that this was going to cause him trouble, he said, look, is, is it better to do good or to do harm? Is it better to save a life or to kill? Jesus would often do this. He would frame his questions in extremes. The obvious implication is that failure to do good or to save a life was wrong and not in keeping with God's original intention for the Sabbath. God created the Sabbath to be a blessing to mankind. God, you know, he created the world, of, you know, the seventh day he rested. Eventually, the Sabbath was sort of a memorial to that. And the idea was, you guys work hard all week long. Let's have one day where you can rest, where you can recalibrate, where you can you know, make your relationships right, where you can be together with your family, whatever your blessing is. The Sabbath was meant to be a blessing for people. That's, why God, that's what God had intended for. That's what Jesus is trying to, to demonstrate. The Sabbath is not something that was created to be a burden that would make, turn men into slaves and make them have to fulfill all these regulations. And Jesus knew that by taking action, it would cause him to be in a confrontation with the Pharisees. He saw the need. He knew he was the one who could meet that need, and he acted, despite the fact that he knew it was going to cause a scene, going to cause a situation, Jesus understood that being in ministry is, is not always convenient. There's not always a convenient time to, to be the body of Christ. You think about the Bible and some of the stories. It's not, it wasn't convenient for John the Baptist to follow Jesus. You know the story of John the Baptist and all the things that he did. and He sort of just gave up his life to, to be a... A witness that Jesus is coming, that the Messiah is here, and we need to get ourselves ready. That eventually cost him his life. It wasn't convenient for Stephen to serve the Lord. If you read in the book of Acts, you know, his commitment to Jesus Christ led, you know, Saul and his friends to stone him. You know, I think as long as Paul lived, he probably never forgot the martyrdom of, of, of Stephen. I think that was something that drove him on in his ministry. I was responsible for that. I had Stephen, one of the, the, the you know, first really heroes of the church. I killed that man because he believed in Jesus. And now here I am, a, 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 an apostle of Christ. It wasn't convenient for James to serve Jesus. He was one of the first to be martyred in the book of Acts. And on and on and on it goes. And you can find many examples of people who gave their lives 
to follow Christ, not just to follow, but to serve Him, to get involved, to do something in the name of Jesus. It was never convenient for them to do things. Now, unlike these disciples, and we've been talking about the apostles, I don't think any of us are in danger today of being beheaded for our belief. I don't think if we take action, somebody's going to stone us to death and throw rocks at us. Um, but each of us has to be willing to step up, I think, and serve the Lord even when it's inconvenient to do so. Uh, oh, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy, uh, this is a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy who he considered to be sort of his uh, apprentice, I guess, in the faith. He was kind of teaching Timothy how to be a leader, how to handle the church. And Timothy was a pretty young guy, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Verse, uh, verse 1, I'll just start reading here. I think I'm going to read 4 through 5 probably here. I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the, to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove Rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they'll turn away their ears from the, tr the truth and will turn aside to, to myths. But you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. It's interesting, uh, verse 2, he tells Timothy, look, you got to preach the word and reprove, rebuke. I mean, that's what teachers do. That's what a pastor does. That's what an elder does. But he lays this little piece on there about be ready in season and out of season. Be ready at all times. The Greek word for, or for this phrase, to be ready, it, it has a broad range of meaning that includes the idea of something happening suddenly. Be ready. I mean, it, it may happen suddenly. You've got to be ready. You know, when it happens. It's sort of like a soldier being ready to do battle at a, at a moment's notice. A minute, men for Christ. You know, these guys are ready to, you know, a moment's notice to go and... and and do whatever. You know, it amazes me here at church how fast we can get things organized when there's a real need. The deaconesses, uh, they can organize a meal for a hurting family like that. Uh, there was a meal served to a family downstairs about a year ago. There probably were 20 people in their family that came over. We had a spread that took up the whole back wall of the, the fellowship hall. I mean, it was fantastic. The food and you know, everything was set up to serve them. And I know they threw all that together within a day or two. It just, it just out of nowhere. I mean, the women got together. We're getting this done. And I've seen that over and over and over again. It's not always convenient to serve a family in need. I mean, we've got lives, we've got jobs, things that we got to do, and all of a sudden, er, got to push pause. We're going to go serve these people. God bless them. You've got to be ready in season and out of season. <clears throat> it just amazes me, and on and on it goes. Well, I know today is was communion day, and I usually could go for, man, I could probably go for an hour here. No, I'm not going to do that to you. But I do want to mention something that happened to, to me just this week. And I have permission from the, the gal who went through this. And I'm talking about Cheyenne Lowe. And 
I think it was Wednesday night, I got a call from her that, you know, things aren't good, and and she's given me permission to tell the story. I mean, she had struggled with her pregnancy the whole time, and she had lost a baby before, you know, a year or two ago, or whenever it was. Anyways, uh, but she was hanging on, hanging on, and finally this week, she went in for a regular checkup, they uh, listened for the heartbeat, nothing there. They're thinking, what... You know, and then, so did the ultrasound, and the nurse said, I don't know, we need to get this looked at, and Cheyenne said, she knew, she knew. And so off to the hospital, and then I got a call that evening about what had happened. So I went down there and met with her, and uh, you know, she told me the story, and her boyfriend was there, the father of the child. He was just a young kid. And uh, he was just taking it forward. And my thought was, what am I, what am I going to say to these people? What do, what do I do? You know, uh, I know a lot of people have been through this. My family's been through uh, miscarriage. Uh, others, have, a lot of people within the church, it's something that's quite common, but still devastating when it happens. And so when I left, they were just getting ready to induce labor, and she said, well, I'll, I'll let you know when it's over. I said, okay, I'll be praying for you. So I left. And a couple days went by, hadn't heard anything, so I texted her, well, how did it turn out? You know, I'm still in the hospital, still waiting. I'm like, good night, you know. And she finally had the baby yesterday afternoon. They had tried everything. I mean, when the, when the body's not ready to have a baby, I mean, they don't want to have a baby. That's just the way it is. And, but uh, the baby was delivered, and she called me and wondered if, you know, if I could come down and do some kind of a baptism, some kind of a little service. Or, because they wanted something for the, the child. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm covered, at the time when I got the call, I was covered head to toe in wood chips and dirt. I'd been cutting wood, and I'm just a mess. And I'm like, I'll, uh, I'll be down here in about an hour. Be there when I can. So ran off and got, you know, I'm getting ready. And, and I'm thinking, she uh, had mentioned, you know, she likes songs, love music. And this was supposed to be something that you know, it would be a moment for them to help them through their, their grief. And I thought, well, the best person I know for music is Jen Haynes. So I call her up knowing I'm really putting her on the spot here. You know, imagine yourself getting this call. Hello. Uh, yeah, this is the pastor. Uh, we got somebody that just miscarried. Could you come down and sing a few tunes? <laughs> I mean, what are you going to say? Like, holy smokes. Sorry, Jim, but that's exactly what I did. I put her right on the spot and said, we, we got it. So, Jen meets me down at the hospital, and Eola goes with me, and in we go, and, and there they are. Cheyenne, I knew very well. Her boyfriend, a man that I didn't know, very just a kid. And there, under this tiny little bassinet, was their 20-week-old son, about the size of your cell phone. And I'm like, what in God's name am I going to say to these people who I don't even know if they're Christians, if they're really committed to Christ. All I know is they want their child to be dedicated to God in some way. And, you know, I told Jen, we're making this up as we go. And we went in and we had a nice little service. Jen sang, uh, Jesus loves me. Uh, verses that I had never heard. They were just unbelievable. And Jen, we just love you for that. Just an amazing moment. Very touching. And at that moment, it dawned on me that we're really ministering here in the name of Jesus. And what a blessing it really is for us to have that that opportunity to do that. An inconvenience? Absolutely. I didn't want to go down. 
I'm sure Jen didn't want to go. But ministry is not always convenient. There, when you see a need, there's, you have to move. You have to do something to meet that need. To be the hands, the feet, the voice of Jesus. To minister to somebody in the moment of their greatest need. And when it was all done, you know, I couldn't help but think, you know, in the midst of this, it was, to me it was, a, it was a terrible blessing. Terrible in the sense that this family is going through this. Terrible that, that we went and, and we, we stumbled through it and did the best we could. And, but yet a blessing in the sense that, you know, being a tool of God and being used, it, it, it was amazing. And day after day I have people tell me, you know, I really wish I could get closer to God. I really wish I could find something, some ministry or something to do. Something big, some big thing, you know, we're going to do missions, we're going to do, and all those things are fine, but just look around you. There are people who have needs. Everybody has needs. And when you minister to somebody in the name of Jesus, you're the one that's going to get the blessing. I really understood for the first time what that verse is about, the idea of through, through your weakness. God's strength will be displayed. You know, here we go trucking in there to this room to minister to this family. <laughs> I'm like, what? But through that, God said, no, I'm going to demonstrate my power to this family. To remind them that they didn't do anything wrong with the raising of this kid. He never made it to the fullness of life. But it was a the cause of his death wasn't anything that they had done. They hadn't done anything but love him from the moment of conception up to the, to the end. That baby was, was loved. And they wanted that child dedicated to God. And so that's what we did. We went and we ministered and we did that in the name of Jesus. And please don't come up to me after church saying, wow, that was so cool. Because I didn't want to do it. But I did it because it had to be done. It had to be done in the name of Jesus. That's what all of us need to do. Not just the pastor and the minister of music. When you see a need, don't be afraid to get involved. Don't be afraid to ask God to help you to meet that need like Jesus. Jesus could have easily said, you know, come back tomorrow. I'm, I'll heal you when it's convenient for me. I mean, I could have said, well, you know, hospitals really don't like it when you go down there, and I'm sure they got things to do, and we don't want to do that. It's not a very convenient time for any of us. It wasn't a convenient time for her to lose her baby either. But we know that ministry is not always convenient. The need was there, a hurting little family, and we had to do something to make that tragedy a little more bearable. It definitely was not easy, but God shows His weak, His strength through our, through our weakness. If you want to experience His blessings, you have to get involved. Sitting around waiting for God to, to suddenly become meaningful to you, to suddenly feel like, wow, uh, I really like this Christian stuff. It really is true. you got to get involved. What's God calling you to do? How can you serve in the name of Jesus? I called Jen because I can't sing a tune in a bucket. I, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. But I brought, Jen came in and Cheyenne's eyes just lit up. She goes, oh, Jen's here. She sings like a goddess. And I'm like, no pressure or anything there. <laughs> what can you do to serve in the name of Jesus? I know it's not convenient. I know it's not always timely, but the greatest needs that people have, they don't arise according to a convenient schedule. We have to be ready in season and out, as Paul told Timothy. Be ready at all times to not only speak the Word, but to live it. I 
Well, that said, often our maturity is most revealed through times of inconvenience. C.S. Lewis once stated that surely what a man does when he is taken off his guard is the best evidence of what sort of man he is. When there are needs that need to be met, and you don't want to when things come up out of nowhere, when you're called upon to serve outside of your giftedness or outside of your comfort zone. These are the moments when you can make the greatest impact for the kingdom. Not through your skill, but through your showing them your love. Expressed in inconvenient ways. Jesus wants us to count the cost of our commitment because he knows it will demand everything that we have. In essence, Jesus warns us, you know, you know, stay away from this romantic view of following me. He understands that when we volunteer to go anywhere at any time, that romanticism will wither. When our commitment becomes inconvenient, or when it collides with the full cost of discipleship. We no longer have the choice to serve when and where it's convenient for us. The Bible says foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lie down and rest. At no time in his life did Jesus have it easy where he could take a break, where he could rest, where he could take time off for ministry. He understood that to follow his calling, the calling that God had placed upon him, it's a full-time thing. To be ready in season and out of season. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I kind of put a challenge out there to everyone. God, help us to minister in your name even when it's inconvenient. When it's going to cost us. When we're going to have to give up an evening. Help us to give to this church financially when it's inconvenient to do that. Help us to love our neighbor when they're unlovable. God, we love you today. Bless this church and thank you, God, for so many talented, gifted, giving people in this church who just drop everything and serve one another. I'm so proud to be involved with this, this work. And God bless us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ezekiel in the Old Testament is a, a prophecy about the people, God's people, um, about this valley full of dry bones and how those dry bones would come together and, and they would become people. And, and those were to be the people of Israel. And, and they were supposed to go where God wanted them to go, to go where God had, had sent them. And... Um, that's kind of what I thought of when John told me he was talking about service. I thought about how it seems like this world today is full of all these dry bones, all these people who are just lost and, and they need to go where God is sending them. And so that's, um, we're going to sing about that uh, to close our service. Would you stand and sing with me? Come alive. <clears throat>
it's a click, click cookies for the garbage man. I don't care. You know, find something you can do to be a blessing to somebody. Even if it means you got to give up a little time, maybe a little money. Find somebody. Be a blessing. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this church, this wonderful, beautiful church. God, we love them. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.